Election night is more than a month away, but the Gwinnett County Elections Office has been humming for weeks. It's always Labor Day. I tell everyone Labor Day is like the official kickoff of election season. Elections Director Zach Manifold says training for 2,000 poll workers is underway. Machines are slicing open absentee ballot applications. Workspaces are being prepared. This is where everything will happen on election night. All the memory cards will come to this table right here. Amid all this, Manifold has been closely watching moves by the state election board. The board has approved several last-minute changes despite Republican state officials and throngs of local election officials opposing them. Travis Doss is elections director in Richmond County. You can have 10 elections director stand up there and say, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. And then the board says, I make a motion that we approve this rule. And tensions on the board are growing as the Republican members hint their work is not done and criticize anyone questioning their motivations. Character assassination, yes. Media murder, yes, and lawfare lynching. And that's that's where this is all headed. Plus, former President Donald Trump rallies in Savannah. And we'll get a view on the U.S. election from Germany. I'm WAB politics reporter Sam Greenglass. And I'm WAB politics reporter Raul Bally. And this is Plugged In, a WABE politics podcast. So, Sam, let's dig in more to what's going on with the state election board. So much to keep up with. What is the latest? The board was already drawing scrutiny for rules related to certification of election results. The latest rule passed by the election board last Friday mandates poll workers in each precinct hand count the number of ballots to make sure that that total matches the number of ballots recorded by the scanner. Charlene Alexander, a Republican, who lives in Fayette County sponsored the rule and she compared it to a basic cross check. You could be looking at the back. It doesn't matter. You're strictly going to go to the corner and you're just going to count those ballots. Now, how difficult is that? To be clear, this rule is about counting ballots, not tallying votes for individual races or, you know, what says on those ballots. But nonpartisan election officials testified to the state election board that even so, hand counts are slower and less reliable and any discrepancies could open the door for misinformation about the integrity of the election. Plus, officials like Irwin County Election Supervisor Ethan Compton said that it's just way too late to be changing these rules. Over 200 pages of elections code and rules have been implemented since 2020. We have practiced on them. We have trained. We are ready. Do not change this at the last second. And Raul, you could really hear the frustration from election officials like Milton Kidd of Douglas County, who feel like their pleas for a pause on these new rules have just fallen on deaf ears. I've stayed at a lot of Waffle Houses in my life, but that does not qualify me to operate a Waffle House. Listen to the experts. Sam, there's also a legal question as well here, right? Take a listen to nonpartisan State Election Board Chair John Verveer, who voted against these new rules. If this board votes to implement this rule, I think that we put ourselves in legal jeopardy. And in fact, Georgia's Republican Secretary of State and Republican Attorney General told the members of the board explicitly that these moves likely exceed the board's power. So like the certification rules, which are set to be before a judge next week on October 1st, I expect we may see these new rules about hand counting ballots in court as well. And Sam, it seems like the drama has continued to unfold. At the beginning of the show, you heard Republican board member Jan Johnston calling the blowback lawfare lynching. Well, that tone really continued throughout Monday's meeting. Here's Republican member Janelle King clashing with nonpartisan chair John Verveer. Mr. Chairman. I think it's inappropriate for us to 
your each other on trial. Mr. Chairman, no one's putting anyone on trial. Your reaction is, is way more than necessary. And King there is basically trying to tamp down accusations that the Republican board members have been acting with a partisan agenda to essentially help former President Donald Trump lay the groundwork for disputing the election results. And King and the other Republican members were really trying to push back on that. But some of the rules, Raul, have been crafted with input from activists and groups who have vocally called into question the integrity of the 2020 election without evidence. And that has led three Democrats to file ethics complaints against these three Republican members. On Wednesday, those Democrats filed a lawsuit seeking to force Governor Brian Kemp to advance an ethics complaint that they filed against the board's three Republicans. So, Sam, what's going on with that? The suit is challenging an opinion from the attorney general's office that the governor doesn't have to forward a complaint against the board members. A Kemp spokesman says their office doesn't comment on pending litigation. And one more thing, Raul, before the board wrapped up on Monday, they also voted to investigate eight mainly Democratic counties, including Fulton, Gwinnett, Cobb, and DeKalb, for tossing mass voter challenges filed by a handful of individuals. Activists like DeKalb GOP chair Marcy McCarthy demanded prompt action, but nonpartisan board chair John Fervier basically had to temper her expectations because state law pauses voter challenges 45 days before an election. So I think these competing expectations about what's going to happen immediately out of this investigation are really setting up a heated meeting when the board reconvenes in October. Okay, so Sam, bottom line this for me. How much should voters worry about all of this, whether it's voting or, you know, getting the results? Well, at the end of the day, Raul, whether these most controversial rules end up taking effect ahead of the election, that will likely be decided by a judge. And while concerns about disruptions or confusion are certainly real and something that I know I will be watching for and following very closely, there are also checks and balances like the courts to step in and ensure results do get certified on time. I asked Zach Manifold in Gwinnett County how he's thinking about all of this, and he says while he's really clear-eyed about the risks— he also has reason to feel optimistic. If you worry and worry and worry, like it'll just eat you alive. The people working your polling location are your neighbors, your teachers and your firefighters. And that makes me feel really good. I think at the end of the day, it really is run by your community. But as we know, that hasn't always been enough when distrust in elections among some voters still runs really deep. You know, Sam, I've said it on the podcast before, and I'll say it again. So much of what we deal with when it comes to elections and voting ends up in the courts. And Raul, as we talk about courts and voters and the approaching Election Day, a big ruling from the Georgia Supreme Court this week, likely the final decision on which independent and third party candidates are qualified to be on Georgia's ballot. This has been quite a saga, but now it seems like we are at the end of the road finally. Is that right? It seems like it, based on my conversation with at least one of the lawyers who's been involved, it seems like we are at the end of the road. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Let me start by taking you over to the Georgia Supreme Court, which is now located a block away from the state capitol. It's a seven-year-old building that still kind of has a new feel to it compared to some of the really old buildings that you and me normally go to. You may be seated. In the beautiful 6-4 chamber, eight of the nine justices heard arguments Tuesday morning from a group of lawyers on a group of cases that focused on whether independent candidate for President Cornell West and socialist presidential candidate Claudia De La Cruz were qualified to appear on Georgia's ballot. Now, Sam, before I get to the actual arguments, I want to share something that I always seem to notice about higher level courts like the Georgia Supreme Court. Sam, they get to the point very, very quickly. This is attorney Brian Tyson, who represents Cornell West. And this is exactly 24 seconds into his opening statement. The process of nominating petitions exists so that independent candidates can show they have a degree of support among the public to obtain ballot access. Mr. Tyson, I I am sorry to interrupt you, but our time is short. That's Georgia Supreme Court Justice Sarah Warren, who ended up writing the opinion on behalf of the court that was released Wednesday afternoon. That's 
Sam, like 29 hours after the arguments ended. Okay, so this decision was unanimous. Let's get to the bottom line. Explain what they said. The justices did not decide any constitutional issues, but rather that the nominating petitions were not filed properly for West and De La Cruz. Back to attorney Brian Tyson, he told me after the decision, because the ruling is not on constitutional grounds, he thinks appealing up to a federal court might be challenging. Back to the courtroom. The other important point that was talked about is the justices wondering what should be done if they had decided to disqualify De La Cruz and West, which they ended up doing. This is Justice Andrew Pinson questioning Assistant State Attorney General Elizabeth Young, who represents Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger. You know, could paper ballots be reprinted? The answer was no, simply because the ballots, A, were already printed, and B, there is not enough watermark paper so the question is to what, front new ones. But I, I, the question is, what, um, what will the secretary do in the event that this order is affirmed to the best of Comply with 2125C, which uh, involves posting of notices and also including uh, in absentee ballot envelopes notices in there as well. So, Sam, let me explain what all of this means. The Secretary of State's office is saying it is too late to change printed absentee ballots along with the programming for voting machines. So the names of Cornell West and Claudia De La Cruz will appear on ballots along with signs at voting precincts and notices with mailed absentee ballots saying votes cast for these two candidates will not be counted. So. The votes that will be counted will be for Republican Donald Trump, Democrat Kamala Harris, Libertarian Chase Oliver, and the Green Party's Jill Stein. It seems like they should get stickers like they have in some other states where this has come up. Well, anyways, talk to me about the possible political implications of this decision. So these challenges were backed by Democrats, Sam. It's likely that some West and De La Cruz supporters will not vote at all. Some may still cast a ballot for the Green Party's Jill Stein, and some may even for Vice President Harris. But frankly, that's a scenario that's difficult for me to believe, and here's why. A couple of months ago, I went to an event featuring Stein and Socialist Vice Presidential Candidate Karina Garcia. Issues like the conflict in the Middle East and the economy, again, make it hard for me to believe that those voters are going to go to Harris. So on the one hand, in a state decided by slim margins, even a few thousand votes do matter. But as you're saying there, Raul, it's not clear that these voters going for West or De La Cruz were really in play for Harris anyways. That's right, Sam. Now, also this week, Republican vice presidential candidate J.D. Vance canceled his two rallies in Georgia due to Hurricane Helene. WABE will continue to have live coverage of the storm on the radio at 90.1 and at WABE.org. But former President Donald Trump did manage to make it to his rally in Savannah on Tuesday. Trump pitched a plan to stimulate manufacturing during that event in Savannah. He promised to slash corporate taxes for foreign companies that relocate to the U.S. and also impose steep tariffs on companies that don't. He said his plans will result in more products made in the USA. Or if you prefer, if you have to do it, made in Georgia, you can do that. And they'll be exported through the port of Savannah. So Savannah is among the busiest ports in the country. Number three, in fact, after Los Angeles, Long Beach and New York, New Jersey. By the way, hint, hint, trivia, trivia. I'll explain more in a second. Now, the Harris campaign says tariffs could jack up the price of goods. Instead, Harris wants to build off the Chips and Science Act and the Inflation Reduction Act, which incentivize manufacturing products like semiconductors and electric vehicles. Now, Trump did not stay on this economic message for the entirety of his one-hour speech and had many of the usual tangents. But after bashing Governor Kemp at his last rally in Georgia back in August— In Savannah, he called the governor fantastic, a nod at the importance of Kemp and his political machine for Republicans winning statewide in Georgia. Though I should add that Kemp was not at this rally. He was out of the state campaigning for the GOP Senate candidate in Pennsylvania. And also coming up this weekend, Trump will be at the UGA Alabama game in Tuscaloosa. 
And Raul, I should mention that Coach Tim Walls, the Democratic vice presidential nominee, also a former high school football coach, will be at my alma mater in Ann Arbor for the Michigan-Minnesota game at the Big House. So a huge weekend for the intersection of college football and politics. Welcome to fall in the USA, I guess. So before we take a break here, I did give you a little hint, and now we have a plug for Plugged In, the semi-annual WABE Pints and Politics Trivia Night, next Thursday, October the 3rd at 6.30 p.m. It's at Monday Night Brewing in West Midtown. Tickets are 15 bucks, and you can sign up online at wabe.org slash events. We'd love to see you there. This is Plugged In, a WABE Politics podcast. Welcome back to Plugged In, a WABE politics podcast. Today, we're joined by a very special guest, Laura Houtkamp. She's a German journalist with ARD, Germany's largest public broadcasting organization, and she's been reporting from WABE through the Burns Fellowship. It is great to have you with us, Laura. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. So, Laura, tell us first just a little bit about your background in journalism in Germany. I work with ARD, um, which is comparable to the British BBC as it's funded by the German public. And I'm normally based in Bavaria, which is in the south of Germany, where I cover mainly politics on national and international level for both TV and radio. You know, I'm curious about your perception of American politics before you came here to report. I've got to say, I follow American politics with this mix of fascination, concern, and honestly, a bit of what on earth is happening. Sometimes it's, you know, just, you know, back in Germany, waking up to American politics, it feels like, you know, waking up to another episode of House of Cards. Um, And, you know, since U.S. policies have such a huge global impact, including right back home in Europe, I'm watching everything unfold, especially with the upcoming election, really closely. Okay, so, Laura, you arrive to Atlanta, and I think this is like your first week in Georgia, and you got to cover one of Vice President Kamala Harris's very first rallies in Atlanta since she became the presumptive Democratic nominee. This is not long after President Joe Biden bowed out of the race, former President Donald Trump survived an assassination attempt. Kind of crazy introduction to Georgia politics, right? Oh, definitely. I still remember being completely blown away by the line of people waiting to get into the rally. And the vibe was just so, I think, euphoric, almost like a festival. And let me tell me, you the, the effort people put into their outfits, that was next level. I mean, Harry's face and name on shirts, stars and stripes everywhere you looked. It was like patriotism meets pop culture. And then actually stepping into the convocation center, I wasn't really sure if I'm at a political event or a pop concert. There was a DJ hyping up the crowd and the energy was just electric. And then out of a sudden, Megan the Stallion hits the stage. And I thought, is this really happening? It's one of those pinch me moments because That kind of crossover between politics and celebrity, it's just unimaginable in Germany. So you also were part of kind of another tradition, which is door knocking. And you went along with Georgia Democratic State Representative Jasmine Clark. There's one thing to just say it's an expectation that you vote. It's another thing to have someone knock on your door and say, I would really love for you to vote. And here is why this is so important. So Representative Clark has a podcast about suburban women, and one of the big points she makes is that the suburbs are a lot more diverse than people imagine. I'm curious if the suburbs are such a key place in German politics and and whether you see the same diversity in German suburbs. Yeah, that's pretty different in Germany. Suburbs just don't have the same political weight as they do in the U.S. In German politics, it's much more about the urban versus the rural divide rather than focusing on the suburbs. And for diversity, it's also not quite the same picture. German suburbs are usually middle to upper middle class and they are way less diverse compared to cities. 
You see more diversity popping up around big cities like Berlin, Frankfurt, and Munich as more immigrants move in, but it's still not on the same level you'd find in, in American suburbs. The impact of that change is there, but it's way more subtle and doesn't really shape politics in the same way. Hmm. You know, you also went to a Republican women's lunch in Alpharetta and met a woman named Mary Carp. The left, their big issue is abortion. That's all they talk about. They don't talk about things like paying your grocery bill. They don't talk about how women don't have enough money to, you know, in, indulge in themselves because of the wild inflation and how women are having to make so many sacrifices like that. So she's talking about inflation there. We understand that inflation is not just an American phenomenon, is, but is this something Germans are grappling with too? And how much is it shaping politics? Yeah, inflation is also a big deal for Germans too. It's really hitting people where it hurts and rising costs, especially energy costs, are squeezing disposable incomes and eating into purchasing power, which has left a lot of folks feeling frustrated and anxious about what's ahead. I think it's the same kind of feeling you see in the U.S., where everyone's worried about how far their money can stretch. But interestingly, in the recent state elections in East Germany, so that just happened last month, it wasn't just inflation on people's minds. It was social security and immigration that really were like the main concerns. So while inflation is huge, those other issues are really driving the conversation, especially in the east of Germany. So, Laura, you mentioned immigration there. You know, we hear a lot about how the rise of the far right is not just isolated to the United States and that anti-immigrant rhetoric is happening in Europe as well. How is that playing out in Germany? So we just had state elections uh, in the east of Germany um, and the far right, the AFD, the alternative for Germany, they made huge gains there, especially in places like Saxony, Thuringia and Brandenburg. In Saxony, they grabbed over 30 percent of the vote in some areas, overtaking the conservatives and social democrats. Their anti-immigrant and nationalist stance is really striking chord with voters feeling left behind or fed up with the mainstream. And now everyone's in Germany wondering, how will the AFD perform nationally in next year's general election? Hmm, so some overlapping themes there between the U.S. and Germany. I wonder, though, does Germany have an equivalent to Georgia, like a swing region that plays such a crucial role in shaping elections? You talked about a couple of specific regions. Are there places that are this big mix that, that shape outcomes like we have here in Georgia? In, in Germany, we don't really have swing states like in the U.S. because every vote counts proportionally. So no single region is a make or break. The whole political system is set up differently. No winner-takes-all approach, which means parties really have to campaign across the entire country, not just, not just focus on a few key areas. Um, that said, places like North Rhine-Westphalia, parts of Bavaria and Eastern Germany still matter a lot. They're like political barometers where shifting voter behavior can really shake things up in national elections. These regions get a lot of attention during campaigns because they often signal broader trends that could impact the whole country. So, Laura, I, I kind of want to take you back to the Harris rally and then kind of compare that to the actual campaigning for national office compared to the United States. And, and also kind of the bigger picture, are, are folks bombarded with ads? Is there tons of money involved in, in campaigning in Germany? So political ads are definitely a thing in Germany, but they are way less in your face compared to the U.S., I mean, TV and radio ads are actually limited by law. So parties get some free but strictly regulated airtime on public broadcasters. And you won't see nearly as many paid ads. Instead, you'll notice more billboards, posters, and of course, ads on social media. Another big difference is that we have strict limits on donations and spending. So there's a lot less influence from wealthy donors and lobby groups. The whole tone of campaigning also is generally less aggressive, I'd say, and more focused on policy. Although, as I just mentioned, with the rise of the far right in recent years, things have started to shift and you definitely feel the change in the rhetoric. Um, and I just looked up some numbers before uh, taping, taping this podcast. In 
The last federal elections, so that was um, four years ago, all major parties together in Germany spent about 55 million on their campaigns. Meanwhile, I just learned in the US, presidential candidates and their allies are gearing up to spend over half a billion dollars on TV and radio ads just in the final seven weeks. Talking about a spending gap, right? You know, Laura, I just pulled up um, a data point from Ad Impact Politics. Here in Georgia alone, there are $70 million of ads booked by the Trump and Harris campaigns between now and Election Day. That's just Georgia alone to give you a little bit of kind of context. That's crazy. Crazy. So, Laura, at the beginning of our conversation, you mentioned that, you know, American politics are a bit of a fascination, both for you and other people in Germany. But I wonder when you look at policy, like why do Germans, Europeans, and I guess media globally care so much about the outcome of the U.S. election? I know even back in 2022, during our Senate race uh, at the final rallies, you would have trouble getting a spot in the malt box to plug into the sound system because there were reporters from Germany and Japan and the U.K. and all over the world who care about what happens in Georgia and the States. So maybe can you explain a little bit more about why that is? I think, you know, when it comes to American politics, it's just, you know, that it has such a huge global impact, you know, um, talking about NATO, um, talking about even, you know, the war uh, in Ukraine um, and the war in in Israel um, and Gaza. So I think um, everybody just knows that America still is like the biggest player and the most important uh, ally for um, for Europe um, and the Western world. So I think that's definitely um, a thing to to mention here. And I mean, it's just the fascination of the U.S., right? So it is really, as I mentioned before, it's like waking up. Uh, to another episode of House of Cards every day. I mean, we just had two assassination attempts uh, on Donald Trump. That's just crazy. So, Laura, I'd really like to know what's been the most surprising thing that you have learned covering American politics that you're going to be thinking about as you go back home to report. Hmm. I think one of the biggest surprises covering U.S. politics is just how much personality spectacle and emotional connection drive everything, it's way beyond policies. And I think that's a big contrast to Germany's more reserved, policy-focused approach. And then there's, of course, the polarization and the sheer spread of misinformation that's constantly shaping public opinion. That was really eye-opening to see how easily narratives can take hold and influence voters. And as we gear up for our own election in Germany, so this is this time next year, it's a reminder that while our systems are different, of course, the emotion pull and the impact of misinformation are becoming more similar than we might like to admit. Laura Houtkamp, thank you so much for sharing your reporting. And it's been such a pleasure having you in the WABE newsroom. And I hope you're getting sleep and gearing up for the next wild couple of weeks here before Election Day. You bet. Thanks for having me on the podcast. It was great. Thanks so much, Laura. That's it for this edition of Plugged In, a WABE politics podcast. Plugged In is a production of the WABE Politics Desk. Our producer is Brendan Rivers. Our managing editor is Alex Helmick. And if you appreciate this podcast, subscribe, leave us a rating, and remember to come out and see us at Pints and Politics Trivia Night, Thursday, October 3rd. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.